Minister, as we know, is back in Australia now after a whirlwind trip overseas, which did include a visit to Ukraine's capital of Kiev, where he committed another $100 million worth of more help and military hardware. Colonel Douglas McGregor is the former advisor to the US Secretary of Defence, and uh, he joins us now. Colonel, thank you very much for your time. Uh, appreciate it, as always. First of all, just on the Australian commitment before we get to um, the, the broader picture in Ukraine, how much help can... Australia be when we provide weapons such as Bushmasters, APCs, etc., to Ukraine? How much help is that on the ground? I think you have to keep in mind that 80% uh, of the Ukrainian military that existed at the beginning of this war is now destroyed. 80% of its manpower killed or wounded. And even in the best of times, a standing professional force has difficulty rapidly assimilating new weapons, particularly the kind that you just described, that are not easily employed without first uh, serious training. So I would argue that probably not a great deal. Of course, there is a plan, I, I'm told, in Washington to sustain this conflict indefinitely until uh, the Russians are defeated or we run out of cash, I don't know which, but uh, in the short run, no, I don't think it'll have much impact. So, so when it comes to p potentially changing the course of the conflict, uh, again, you would, you would suggest minimal? Yeah, if you look at the enormous losses the Ukrainians have taken, uh, how well would anybody do under those circumstances if you're bringing in reservists, uh, essentially pressing manpower into uniform to fight that are not trained and, and have no experience? It's not going to go very well. In the meantime, the, the Russians uh, have withdrawn most of their regular army combat forces, about 70 to 80 percent of them. They're resting and refitting, and most of the fighting is being done by Russian separatists from uh, eastern Ukraine, Chechens, mercenary troops backed by Russian artillery. So the Russians are by no means overstretched or hurting mm. at this point. So what could nations like Australia be doing instead of of the weapons or the military hardware that we're providing? What could we be doing instead? Well, if you understand that the longer this lasts, the more people are going to be needlessly slaughtered, the more damage will be done to Ukraine. It's already effectively a failed state. It could be erased completely from the map. Then I would argue that we need a ceasefire. And Australia should press for that because no one in Washington is going to do it. But I'm hearing from people in uh, Berlin and Paris and those in London who would like to have another no confidence vote and remove Boris Johnson, that there's growing support for just that, to argue for a ceasefire and come to some sort of arrangement because we can't afford to fight this until there are no longer any Ukrainians left. But would, in your experience, would Vladimir Putin agree to something like that? Because, as you know, he wants the whole box and dice. Well, Vladimir Putin was never interested in all of Ukraine. Uh, the territory that he currently controls is really the traditional Russian-speaking area. It was part of Russia. And that was the area where the majority of Ukrainian forces were concentrated. His great concern was that those forces would attack Russia and that we would inevitably de deploy uh, theater ballistic missiles there to hold his mm. nuclear capability at risk. So, no, I don't, I don't think it's a question of that. He's not going to withdraw. That's out of the question. Yeah. So if if you're unwilling to come to some sort of arrangement uh, on a on a territorial basis, then I would suggest certainly an armistice. So the longer this lasts, yeah. the larger the probability of a wider regional war. Yeah. Well, I mean, as things stand at the moment, if no one backs down, how long does this thing last? And and of course, as we know, it's got it's got huge flow on effects around the world when it comes to energy. Yes. Well, the Russians, again, are, are holding all the cards at this point. Uh, most of the sanctions that we've tried to impose have blown back on our allies and have hurt us. Mm. The Russians are not hurting, and they've been able to sell energy, minerals, resources, uh, grain, food, everything to China, to India, uh, to Japan, to other nations in the world who are willing to buy it. Mm. So the only ones that have really suffered as a result of our sanctions, I think, severely are our European allies and the United States. Meanwhile, you've got Sweden and, and Finland likely to join NATO. How much does that ruffle Putin's feathers? I don't think he cares at all. Uh, he's never felt threatened by either Sweden or Finland. There's no evidence that either of those states are interested in waging war against him. He has no designs on them. 
So I, I think it's meaningless. I think the Swedes, as the Swedish ambassador in Washington said, well, we're spending 4% of gross national product on defense. And now that we're joining uh, NATO, we can cut that to 2%. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't think that this is some sort of new grand alliance designed to destroy Russia at all. That's a good point. Uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, it's, it's always uh, an interesting chat when we've got you on. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. We'll talk to you again soon. Sure.